I want to invite you, if you will, to open up a copy of God's Word to the book of Hebrews in the New Testament, and we're looking at Hebrews chapter 13. And we're finding out together is so important. It is the calling of the Holy Spirit uh, through the writing of His Word, community, because life is not meant to be lived alone. It is so important that we experience togetherness. And we find this through the 14 times the Holy Spirit with these words says, Let us, uh, let us hold fast our confession of faith. Uh, Let us approach the throne of grace boldly. Uh, Let us go on to maturity. Uh, Let us be thankful. Uh, Let us not forsake the gathering of God's people as the manner of some is but let us encourage one another so much more as we see the day approaching this is the calling of the Holy Spirit and this morning as you open your Bibles notice in chapter 13 verse 13 that we're encouraged to let us go out to Jesus outside of the camp bearing his disgrace So as we look at this text this morning, let's get the context. We'll begin reading at verse number 8. And I'm going to invite you, as we do as a faith family, we stand to honor the reading of God's wonderful, life-changing, inerrant, infallible word that enriches our life. Can I get a witness this morning? Amen. Amen. It is so good to stand for something worth standing for. Hebrews chapter 13, beginning at verse number 8, church family, read aloud with me the word of God. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Do not be led astray by various kinds of strange teachings, for it is good for the heart to be established by grace and not by food regulations, since those who observe them have not benefited. We have an altar from which those who worship at the tabernacle do not have the right to eat. For the bodies of those animals whose blood is brought into the most holy place by the high priest as a sin offering are burned outside the camp. Therefore, Jesus also suffered outside the gate so that he might sanctify people by his own blood. Let us then go to him outside the camp, bearing his disgrace. For we do not have an enduring city here. Instead, we seek the one to come. And Father, we say yes and amen to the word of God. And we pray, Lord, one simple prayer. And that is, Spirit of the living God, would you speak to every heart here? Would you allow us to hear you in a very clear way through the power of the Word of God? For we ask and we pray and we speak in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you so much for standing. As we think about what we have experienced the last week, uh, we can say that we have gone through turbulent times. Can I hear a witness this morning? Uh, how, how, uh, what it was the wind velocity at your place? Was it 50 mile an hour, 70 mile an hour, 100 mile an hour, 150 mile an hour? Uh, what, what we have found is that this wind turbulence has revealed several things. It has revealed the strength, the stability. It it also reveals security uh, that is about the the structure that we're in and even in our very lives. Well, this whole world is shaking, is it not? It's not a one-day hurricane, but this whole world is experiencing a hurricane. And as chapter 12, verse 24 says, God is shaking the earth once more so that the things that can be shaken would be removed And the things that cannot be shaken, that they would remain. And so we as God's people, what what is remaining in the midst of this this, uh, turbulent world in which we're living? Well, you'll notice several things I'll just point out in in this text. Verse number 8, Jesus Christ is unshakable. (laughs) 
<laughs> Even though everything else is shaking, Jesus is not shaking. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Now, don't miss this. Yesterday, what's that speaking of? That's speaking of the Jesus of history. We have four uh, evangelists that have been recorded in the New Testament. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. They're, they're the gospel accounts. And these are historic, this is stories of history of the Son of God who actually walked on this earth, who actually welcomed sinners, who actually was moved with compassion, who actually prayed. And that same Jesus that we read of history is the Jesus of contemporary right here and now. <laughs> He's a Jesus this morning when you got out of bed. I'm not sure what God you woke up to, but the God of the Bible we go, woke up to with open arms. And he was saying, I can't believe he's awake today. I can't believe she's awake today. I'm going to spend all day with him. And so we wake up to this Jesus who has compassion, this Jesus who prays for us as we have read in the book of Hebrews. And guess what? This Jesus isn't going to change tomorrow. He's going to be that way forever. So in the midst of, of change, in the midst of turbulence and winds that are blowing, we have this unchanging person of Jesus. But notice also in the next verse that we have the unchanging provision of grace. I, I love this text where it says, let our hearts, uh, it is good for the heart to be established in grace and not in regulations. Uh, what, what are you establishing your heart in? He might say, well, I, I'm trying to be good enough for God. Let me tell you, you can't do enough good things to be right with God. It's not by any works that we do that we can brag about how good we are. It's not about our knowledge. Uh, the demons in hell trump our knowledge of Scripture, and yet they do not, uh, they're not going to heaven. And so it's not about doing more things and knowing more things. It's about having our hearts established in grace. And that grace that we have uh, will move us and compel us in our daily life to walk in this whole realm that God has given us. That is unshakable, this provision of grace. But also notice that there is an unshakable place of forgiveness. Notice here the announcement of the writer of Hebrews in verse 10. Underline this, circle it in your Bibles. We have an altar. We have an altar. What is that? That is a place where we meet with God. That is a place where we could come to God based not on our terms but on His terms. We have an altar that we could come to and find forgiveness of sin. We could find righteousness with God and we could be justified for eternity. We have an altar. Say that to your neighbor. We have an altar. <laughs> now, if you're in first century B.C. and you read this, this was just a few months before the temple in Jerusalem would be destroyed by Titus, the Roman general, in A.D. 70. Jerusalem was razed. In other words, it was brought down to rubble, and that included the temple. And so the Jews were saying that the, the altar that was in the Holy of Holies has now been destroyed. We are hopeless and the writer of Hebrews says, there is hope because we have an altar. And that altar is what we proclaim of Jesus Christ. Now, what does it mean when we look in verse number 12 that Jesus also suffered outside the gate for us? What, is, what does that mean that he might sanctify the people by his blood? And then notice in verse 13, the clear word of the Spirit of God, let us go out to Jesus outside the camp bearing his disgrace. What does that mean? What does it mean that Jesus suffered outside the gate? Outside the gate would be the Kidron Valley. It would be the, the place of Gehenna. It would be the place of the of the sewer or the, the dung heap outside the gate. Outside the gate along the, the mount there where the temple mount was at, outside that gate, the lion's gate, there is a hill that they would execute criminals on. It was known in the, in the Hebrew and the Greek and the Latin Galgotha, Skulls Hill. 
Well, what does it mean that Jesus suffered there? We'll go a lot more deeper in the text as this message goes along. But it was a place of utter humiliation. I preach today under a nice white lit cross. But I want to remind you this morning that when Jesus suffered outside the gate, it was anything but a white cross. It was a blood-stained cross. It was a cross that he bore your sin. I mean, you think about it. Every wrong thought, every wrong deed, every wrong action, every wrong word, every violation of God's law, it was all placed upon him. Jesus suffered. He, the word there is agonized. He bore the brunt of the wrath of God so that you and I can be forgiven, so that you and I could go free. And notice here the exhortation is to go all out. Go out to him. Now, listen to the, the title of this message. Are you, are you listening? Say amen. amen. Let's go all out for Jesus. Let's go all out for Jesus because Jesus has gone all out for us. Let's go, let's go all the way out there to him, to that place of humiliation. Because he has gone all out. For us. Now, what does it mean to go all out for Jesus? It means to be fully committed to the person and the mission of Jesus. It means uh, a place that you put your life in God's hands. You, you push it all in. It means to give your whole energy, your entire life to Him. It means to, to do something with as much effort as possible. To go, to go out to Jesus means to, with full determination, with full enthusiasm, with maximum effort, I'm going after Jesus. For eternity will reveal this, that holding out to Jesus is losing out. That's what eternity will reveal. You see, there's a fear. I'm speaking to the fear of many that are here. I know it was a fear in my heart at one time as a young person, that I would miss out on what life has to offer. I mean, if I go all out to Jesus, if I completely abandon my life, and I, I, I want him to be the Lord of every area of my life, all my relationships, my finances, my career, my future, that, that if I go all out, I'm going to miss out on something. But the danger is, is missing out on all that God has to offer to us. And when we go all out for Jesus, God holds nothing out for us. He gives us everything that we can imagine. So church family, let, let, let's go all out for Jesus. And I want you to notice here the first thing I want to point out in this text today is that Jesus went all out for us. He went all out. He laid it all out when he came. Notice in verse 13, therefore, Jesus also suffered outside the gate so that he might sanctify people by his own blood. Now this text takes us into the very modern time. This Wednesday was Yom Kippur. Our daughter, thank you for praying for our daughter Charity. She arrived back into Jerusalem on Wednesday and she was able to go out to the Western Wall with thousands of Jewish people and they were celebrating Yom Kippur. The only challenge about Yom Kippur is that there is no sacrifice. There is no altar. There's no place to place the sin offering. And so you'll find people throughout Jerusalem, they're wailing because they're longing for the Messiah. They're, they're looking for the Messiah. And here we find in the pages of the Word of God that the Messiah is here. The Messiah has come. The Messiah is Yeshua Yamashiach, the Lord Jesus Christ. That is the one that we worship today. This one. And so he has suffered. And why, why has he done that? It, it's interesting. You'll notice in the text it talks about how the priests don't have a right to come to this altar because uh, they, would take the, they would sacrifice the animal. They would take the blood into a basin. The high priest would take that on the day of Yom Kippur, would place it on the mercy seat on the top of the Ark of the Covenant. And there the sins of the people would be atoned for one year in picture and in a hope for the coming of the Lamb of God that one day would take away the sin of the world. They would take the body of that sacrifice and they would burn it outside the city so that it would not be eaten. 
And with this picture, the, the writer of Hebrews is saying that our sacrifice was not sacrifice. Uh, he didn't go to that, that, uh, that golden altar. He went to a place of utter humiliation. And it is through his blood, this blood of the once and for all sacrifice for our sins, that has sanctified and had removed our sins and has made us holy and acceptable by his blood. Verse uh, number 12, Jesus suffered. You may want to just pause right there, suffering. What does that mean? The most hard-filled cruci- the most hard-filled execution in human history is Roman crucifixion. The Romans learned it from the Phoenicians. The Phoenicians and their cruelty would take rats and they would put a nail and nail them through their spinal cords to the wall. Rome picked up on that. How can we inflict the greatest punishment and cause the greatest fear among the people? And it was through crucifixion. We know the story, but let me tell you more about what it meant for someone to go through Roman crucifixion. They would take them with a Roman flagellum. They would tie them to a post. They would take that whip with uh, leather, with pottery, and with uh, metal, and they would lash that criminal until most of the criminals would die at the point of Roman flagellum. You ask, is Jesus Christ a man? I will tell you, like Napoleon, he's more than a man. He's a God-man. Jesus endured that Roman flagellum, and then he bore the cross. He went to that place of execution. He went up Skull Hill, and there they placed nails in his hands and his feet. They plaited a crown of thorns in utter more humiliation. He's the king of the Jews, he said, and they plaited that crown of thorns upon him. They, he was there naked. There was not clothing upon him. The, 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 the uh, soldiers gambled for his garments around him. It was a place of utter humiliation. Listen to what the Bible says. Jesus suffered. He suffered outside the gate. Now what does this mean that Jesus went all out for us? Well, it means that he went from heaven out for us. He left heaven Uh, Hebrews chapter 10 verse 5 says that as Jesus was coming into the world he said sacrifice and offering you don't do not desire uh, but you prepared a body for me you don't delight in whole burnt offerings sin offerings then I said uh, see it is written about me in a scroll I've come to do your will O God Jesus came into this world in the most amazing way did he not born of a virgin, virgin, immaculately, uh, supernaturally conceived in the Virgin Mary, uh, coming into this world. The God, uh, second person of the Godhead, took on bodily form. It, uh, Jesus went all out for us when he left heaven, but he also went all out for us when he lived sinlessly. Hebrews chapter 4, verse number 15 says that he was tempted in all points as we are, and yet he's without sin. Think about it. Every temptation you go through, every thought of temptation, every luring of the lust, Jesus was tempted in the same way that you and I are, and yet the only difference between him and you is that he was sinless. Jesus obeyed. He went all out uh, when he uh, suffered. Chapter 1, verse 3 says that he made purification for sins by himself. Chapter 2, verse number 18 says that he himself has suffered when he was tempted. Jesus suffered, but then he died. Chapter 2, verse number 14 says that through his death, he destroyed the one having the power of death. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 28, that he died once and for all to make an atonement for sin. Jesus died, but then he rose again from the dead. Chapter 7, uh, verse 16 says that he has the power of an indestructible life. Chapter 13, verse 20 says that God brought up from the dead our Lord Jesus Christ, that great shepherd of the sheep. But not only did Jesus come, not only did he live sinlessly, he went all out for us, not only did he go all out on the death on his cross, uh, but Jesus went all out Not only when he rose from the dead, but when he ascended back up into heaven. Chapter 9, verse number 24 says that he now appears in the presence of God for us. 
So Jesus now, right now, has ascended back up into heaven, and he is there in the presence of God on our behalf. He is our mediator, our bridge builder. And then notice in chapter 9, verse 28, Jesus promises to come again. Christ will appear for the second time to bring salvation to those that are waiting for him. Think about it. Jesus went all out. He went all out for you and for me, leaving heaven, coming to this earth. He went all out when he laid his life down on the cross. He went all out when he got up from the grave on the third day. He went all out when he ascended back up into heaven, and he's coming all out when he comes again. And let me ask you a question. What does that do to your heart? What does that do to your heart? Let me give you a, a story. You, you know about this story back in 2018, 12 young soccer boys with their coach in northern Thailand went cave searching. What they did not realize is that there would be an early monsoon and those boys were, were caught in that cave helplessly for 18 days. It was against all hope. The, the, Navy, the Thai Navy SEALs, the U.S. Uh, Air Force, there were over a hundred divers. There were over a thousand rescue workers that were working tirelessly around the clock. You remember that. I remember every day getting news reports about these uh, 12 Thai soccer players, about that they finally found them, that there was life in this cave. And what you see up on the screen right now is a National Geographic movie called The Rescue. That doc, it's a documentary of all that went through. I, I was on the edge of my seat as I was uh, viewing this d documentary. And those boys, after 18 days, they, there was an, we call this the extraordinary rescue of our time. It is written in our minds and our culture today. This is an extraordinary rescue. But I want to tell you today that that's not the greatest rescue. Because the greatest rescue uh, forever is that our Lord and Savior came into a cave where you and I were suffering and dying without life. And he came to bring us out. That's the rescue. It's the rescue that you and I have. Let me ask you, does that bring joy to your heart this morning? Does that bring gratitude to your heart? You see... Uh, the reason why we're to go all out for Jesus is because Jesus went all out for us. Now what I'm praying right now that's happening in our heart is a Bible verse of 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 14. I'm praying that this will happen in my heart and every heart here. Is that the love of Christ compels us. The love of Christ compels us. Because Jesus went all out for us and Jesus' love compels us to go all out to him the bible says let us go out to him in verse 13 outside the camp bearing his disgrace going out to jesus means drawing near to him it means caring uh, caring for him and what he did in our suffering it means to identify with him outside the camp uh, means the, the place of a criminal's death because he bore our disgrace verse 13 it means that we're to abandon the camp. The, the believers that were reading this in the first century, they were to abandon the camp of Judaism so that they would go unashamedly out to the Lord Jesus. Now let me just pause right here and ask, what camp do you need to leave to go out to Jesus? What camp do you need to leave to go out to Jesus? Maybe it's a camp of complacency. You say, Pastor Michael, I know about Jesus. I've even made some verbal decisions about Jesus. But in my heart of hearts, I, I'm really not following Jesus. Can I encourage you to move out of that no man's land of complacency, spiritual complacency? Because listen to this statement. The road to hell is paved with good intentions. There's a lot of people in hell this morning that wish they could be in a service like this. List they, wish they could hear a Bible message like this. Wish they would have an opportunity like you and I do. If you're in that, if you're in that camp of complacency, come out. Come out to Jesus. Maybe you're, in a, maybe you're in a camp of compromise. 
You say, yeah, I, I'm among believers today, but you would never know it on Monday morning. You would never know it by the way I speak to my, my friends and the language that I use. You, you're, you're in a camp of compromise. Just come out from that. Maybe you're in a camp of a family tradition. You say, well, my mom, my dad, my parents, my grandparents, they, they believe this way, and I, I just have a hard time leaving that. And the calling is to come out uh, to Jesus. You, you've not gotten to know your new pastor's wife that much, but she comes from a, a, a Catholic background. She was raised in Mexico City. So with that, when her, her father, who was an engineer, a vice president of company, when he came, gave his life to Jesus Christ, he was the first one in his family ever to follow Jesus in baptism. It was a big deal. They had family, they had family intensive moments of fellowship, family fights, because it, that, that Manuel has now chosen with his family to follow this Jesus path against the tradition that they've been raised in. Maybe you're in that camp. Maybe you're in a camp of apostates, of unbelievers. Maybe you're a believer, but those that you're around are constantly denying the faith, denying God, denying the things of God. They're talking about them with disrepute and disrespect. Come out from that. Come out. Join the fellowship of the unashamed. Go where Jesus is at. Go where he went uh, for you, that's the calling. And the calling of the Holy Spirit is to go outside the camp bearing his disgrace. Now, what does that mean? What does it mean to go out to Jesus? It means this. It means dethroning self and enthroning Jesus as king. It means dethroning self. I'm not going to live for selfish pleasure, selfish ambition, selfish desires. But now... I'm going to exalt Jesus Christ as king. I want him to be the Lord of my life. I want him to have, I want him to have preeminence, and I want him to have reign over every area of my life. It is an area of complete abandonment, of total surrender unto the Lord Jesus Christ. Follow him. And uh, for, he says in verse 14, we don't have an enduring city here, but we have one to come. Now, how do we go all out to Jesus? We go out, all out to Jesus, first of all, with a grateful heart. I want to invite you, if you will, to take the elements of the Lord's Supper. And if you're a believer here today, and you know Christ as your Lord and Savior, you're invited to participate and partake of the Lord's Supper. Lydia Wyndham, our student pastor's daughter, She's accepted Christ this week, and so today's going to be her first day of participating in the Lord's Supper. So if you're here today and you have accepted Christ, you know Christ, we want to encourage you to participate. You say, well, uh, how are we to partake of this Lord's Supper? The Bible says in a worthy manner. What is a worthy manner? It is having a grateful heart, a heart of gratitude, a heart of thanksgiving. You may be here, you don't uh, if you didn't get one of these, if you'll just raise your hand, our deacons are on the move this morning, and they'll be glad to uh, get you a cup and a piece of bread. And so the way that we participate in a worthy manner is with a grateful heart. Let me ask you, saints of God, is there anyone here today thankful that Jesus died in your place upon the cross? Amen. Amen. So that, that's a worthy manner. And so we want to give gratitude to the Lord. So I want to invite you, if you will, to simply uh, take the piece of bread. The Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, he took this bread and he broke it. He said, I want you to take and eat. This is my body that has been given for you. This do as often as you eat it in remembrance of me. Let's remember with a grateful heart. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you for your body that was bruised and battered, beaten on our behalf. We love you, Jesus. On that same night, our Lord also took the cup. 
He said that this cup is the new covenant, the new testament that's in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it. Do it in remembrance of me. Let's remember him. Lord Jesus, thank you. Thank you for your sacrifice. Lord, you went all out for us. Today, God, we're going all out with you and for you with a grateful heart. We praise you in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, amen. Let me tell you, there's another way that we could go all out for him. And that is in surrender. In surrender. Another way that you go all out with him, bearing his disgrace is by identifying with him in baptism. Now you say, no, pastor, why why should I be baptized? Why should I be baptized? First of all, it's a matter of obedience. Jesus said that Matthew chapter 28, verse uh, 19, that uh, disciples are to be baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. If you believed upon the Lord Jesus, the very next step is baptism. Now, let me speak to some of you here today that just like Jim Phipps today, You would say, I I believed upon Jesus, but the question is, have you been baptized after you believed? It's what we call putting your baptism on the right side of the cross. Uh, For some of you, you were baptized younger, and then you came to a life-changing, transforming faith in Jesus Christ, and since that time, you've not been baptized. You believe first, and then you're baptized. Can you say that with me? Believe first, and then you're baptized. Second reason why you should be baptized is to identify with Jesus. Wasn't it wonderful to see Heather and Jim go through those waters this morning? You know what they did? They were identifying with Jesus. You see, when you're gently lowered underneath the water, it pictures Jesus' death and burial. When you're brought back out of the water, it pictures his resurrection. So it's identity with him. And every day uh, you get to walk in that newness, walk in your identity. The third reason why you're to do it is to have a clear conscience, a clear conscience. First uh, Peter chapter 3 verse 21 says that baptism does not remove the filth of the flesh, but it is the answer of a clear conscience before God. I had the privilege uh, many years ago of pastoring my home church in Richmond Hill, Georgia, just outside of Savannah. And I'll never forget it, as I was pastoring the church, God was doing some amazing things and one day I had, I had a visit from a retired pastor. He was a retired pastor from our community. Matter of fact, I went to school, graduated from high school with his son. His name was Ivy Spence. And Ivy sit, sat across my desk with his wife, tears flowing down his face. He said, Pastor, he said, I have baptized hundreds of people in my 50 years of ministry. But he says, I've never been baptized myself. And I had the privilege of baptizing Ivy and his wife, Anna. They're now in heaven today. But he said this. He said, all of my troubled heart that I had for so many years as a pastor, he said, I now have a clear conscience that I've done what the Lord's asked me to do. Can I speak to some of you right now? Some of you are hindered in your walk with the Lord because you've not done the first thing he's asked you to do after you believed upon Jesus. Let me encourage you to follow the Lord in believer's baptism. You might say, well, I was baptized as a child. Well, if your recent commitment to Christ is a genuine life-changing commitment, I would say put your baptism on the right side of your salvation. Believe first and then be baptized. But you say, no, pastor, I'm a part of another tradition, and I was, I was sprinkled or I was, uh, I was baptized as an infant, uh, all those things. Let, let me encourage you. That your parents, when they were doing that, they were praying that one day you would have a life relationship with Jesus Christ. And now that you have that, follow him. Now you say, now pastor, uh, can you explain, do we have to go under the water? uh, Or can't we just do a little bit of sprinkling over them? Let me encourage you, let me just encourage you, just read your Bible. Because every baptism in the Bible, the Bible says they came up from the water. The word baptizo means the submersion of a ship or the dyeing of a cloth uh, within ink. It speaks about total immersion. And why does it do that? It's because Jesus went all the way under in death and he came all the way out in resurrection. And it pictures that. Romans chapter 6 talks about that. 
And so let me encourage you to do that. I was counseling with a family a number of years ago, a mom, a dad, teenage son, teenage daughter. They all committed their life to Jesus Christ. Oh, it, it, it was a happy celebration in that living room. And uh, then I began to share with them about baptism. And the husband said, yes, sir, you could do it. Matter of fact, I'll never forget the day that we baptized them. The heater in the baptismal pool was broken, and it was 30 degrees outside. And, and I explained to him, and I said, hey, we don't have to do this today. We could wait. He said, Pastor, I don't care if you have to knock ice off that water. We're going to get baptized today. And I'll never forget talking with a husband, a wife, yes, I want to be baptized, teenage son, yes. And then I looked over at the, uh, the young daughter, and she said, no, I, I don't want to be baptized. And I said, well, why not? She said, because I don't want to get my hair messed up. <laughs> and then I just explained to her about how Jesus' hair was messed up for us. About how he wore that crown of thorns and his head was matted together with blood. And that young girl said, yes, I will gladly, I will gladly follow Jesus. Let me encourage you to go all out to Jesus today. All out for him. You may be here this morning and you have never opened your heart and life to Jesus. Never by faith stood before a group like this and said, Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior. The Bible says that when you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, that you shall be saved. And if you're here today, you say, Pastor, that's what I want to do. I want to invite you in just a moment. I'm about to stand right down here with several of our other pastors. Why don't you come and just simply take one of us by the hand and say today, I want uh, to publicly profess my faith in Jesus Christ. There are others of you that are here today that you'd say, Pastor, I believed upon Jesus, but I've never been baptized. I've never been baptized since I believed in Jesus. Why not this morning? Why not now? Why not go out to Jesus, identify with his suffering? We're going to, uh, on October the 23rd, we're going to be going out to Siesta Key Beach. And we're going to have, uh, for mine, it'll be my first beach baptism. I'm so excited about it. And we would love for you to be a part of that amazing celebration. I, I think we have over 10, 15 individuals already that want to be baptized. And I'm believing for many more. I believe that many of you here this morning, you're going to say this morning, sign me up. I want to be a part of that. There are others of you that are here today uh, that you would say, you know what? I, I just need to come and kneel somewhere and surrender my life. I need to dethrone myself and I need to enthrone Jesus. I need to begin to go out to him and bear his disgrace. Would you stand with me just now? So we're standing together. Let me encourage you as our pastors are coming down to the front. Let me encourage you if the Holy Spirit is moving your heart right now, that you would just simply step out, maybe ask one of our pastors to pray for you, make some type of spiritual decision. The altar is open right now. And if the Holy Spirit is speaking to your heart, I would invite you to make that decision for the Lord Jesus. We're going to sing a chorus. As we sing this chorus, I'm going to invite you to respond to the call of the Lord. Father, bless this time of response, for we give it in Jesus' name. Amen. Come just as you
Father, we're grateful today for the invitation to come just as we are. Thank you, Lord, that you don't want us to clean ourselves up and then come. Lord, you desire to, for us to come with all of our brokenness and to experience your cleansing power. Father, thank you for each one that's here today. I pray that as we go to our connect groups, that your Holy Spirit would continue to allow us to bear witness to Jesus, of going all out for Jesus. God, may that be the prayer of our heart and may that be the testimony of our life as we leave this place today. For we pray in Jesus' name and all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. God bless you. Go in peace.